Good evening to everyone in Paraguay and good morning to the people in Australia. Welcome to day four of Paraguay Speak 2022. I would like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from where we all gather today and pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Today's webinar is about digital policy and governance in Paraguay connecting media legacies with digital futures. This event is now live on the PSA Facebook page, and it is also being recorded for our YouTube channel. Join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Paraguay Speaks 2022 or hashtag be part of the conversation. This webinar aims to present the current challenges and opportunities facing Paraguay's approach to digital policy and governance, outline important historical background in the country's media system with the strong parallels to other countries in the broader South and Central American region, characterized by media concentration, state interference, and risks related to reporting on organized crime. Also, we'll examine the current digital policy terrain, drawing attention to the progress underway around developing digital economies and the need for greater emphasis on protecting individuals' digital rights. I have the pleasure to introduce the panelists, Estelle Boyle, a sessional lecturer and early career researcher based at the University of Melbourne. She holds a PhD in media and communication, and her work looks at the intersection of migration, digital media, and digital and social inclusion. Without further ado, here's my professor, Estelle Boyle. Thanks very much, Camilla, um, for your lovely introduction. So I'm just going to go in and share my screen now. Okay, so um, also before I begin today, I would like to first acknowledge, sorry, my slides have just uh, gone backwards there. Um, sorry to interrupt, <laughs> to interrupt that. Before I begin today, I would like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work, the Wurundjeri and Boon people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respect to elders past and present. So good morning everyone in Australia time at least, um, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this year's Paraguay Speaks presentations. As Camilla said, my name is Dr. Estelle Boyle um, and I'm a sessional lecturer in the Master of Global Media and Communication at the University of Melbourne. Um, and I'm also working as a research associate with um, RMIT's node of the Center of Excellence for Automated Decision-Making and Society. And so today I'm going to be delving into Paraguay's digital media regulation with a focus on the broader historical context um, and the contemporary policy priorities. And I also just wanna flag from the outset that I am by no means an expert on Paraguayan media policy specifically. <laughs> um, I lectured on media regulation in Central and South America in a subject I coordinated last semester looking at global data policy. And that's how I've come to be a part of this event today. Um, so when it gets to question time, I'll do my best, but I might not be able to speak to some of the specifics of the Paraguayan context in responding to questions. Um, okay, so in the first part of this talk today, I'm going to, to give an overview of some of the themes and issues in terms of media regulation in the broader South um, and Central American context. So this is a region that's typically been informed by dynastic media powers, so long running family owned media monopolies, as well as post colonization. So on the slide here, you can see the International Telecommunication Union, 
policy tracker map. Um, the ITU is a specialised United Nations agency which is responsible for issues related to information and communication technologies. And this map shows how countries around the world are progressing in terms of their digital policy with countries categorised into five generations of regulation. So the first generation relates to regulation that's developed um, you know, so far in a way that's quite rudimentary with public mon monopolies and command and control approaches. These are the countries in dark blue that you can see on the map. And at the other end of the scale, the fifth generation relates to regulation that's developed um, to the stage where it's collaborative with inclusive dialogue and harmonized approaches across the sectors. And these are the countries that are the sort of more purpley blue. Um, so, um, sorry, just, yep. Um, and so, yeah, there are, of course, some limitations in putting, you know, nearly every country in the world into just five categories. But nonetheless, you know, from looking at this map, we can get a sense of how digital regulation is operating um, to various degrees around the world. And looking at South America, we can see that there are quite a few countries included in the more advanced categories. And this looks good on the surface, um, but the thing is, it's a little bit misleading. So yes, there are advanced policy procedures operating in some places, but these advanced procedures um, can often promote very tight government regulation. So it's, and it, it, it's quite different to what we see in Australia or in the US um, where, you know, advanced digital policy structures are kind of enabling more civic participation and safeguarding citizens' dialogues online. So in Central and South America, there is advanced regulation of digital media, but it's, it's often done to support the very centralised approach of the government. Um, and I'll talk a bit more in detail about some of the approaches happening in Paraguay later in, in this presentation. Um, so when we zoom in and take a look at Paraguay, you can see that the ITU have categorised it as still being within this first generation of regulation. So this puts it in the early developmental stages of digital policy with a lot of scope for progression. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, I'll, I'll return to discuss what's happening here um, in a little while, but for now, I'm going to continue this broader discussion around um, the larger continent. So, as we know, um, most countries in Central and South America have gone through this turbulent process of being colonised, then transitioning out of colonial rule to autocratic rule, and then transitioning to unstable governments. And this remains the case for many countries today. These unstable governments enable extreme political polarization, similar to what might also be seen, you know, in countries in Africa with a similar history of colonization, followed by autocratic rule and then into unstable governments. But what sets Central and South America apart from Africa is that governments in this region have traditionally formed very close alliances with media. They can threaten journalists and they have a history of influencing civic debate and communication that's occurring in media spaces. Digital media have been somewhat beyond the radar screen of governments in the sense that the majority of government interference with civic communication has related to more traditional media forms like television. There have been some ad hoc shutdowns of the internet um, and some bloggers have been threatened. So the digital space is starting to be folded into existing media power dynamics, but not to the same extent as traditional media. So there's this sort of side by side model where traditional media are heavily influenced and remain quite dominant um, and digital media are there um, but they're still somewhat on the outer of these older dynastic media power relationships. Um, but governments are moving towards tighter control of all types of social media content as well, not just relying on internet shutdowns, 
they're putting other laws in place that allow governments to have more direct influence. So on the one hand, officially there's this approach towards enabling and developing a digital economy. But on the other hand, we still see significant centralization of digital governance. So digital policy in Central and South America is situated between these two poles of perceived investment in digital economies and then the facilitation of more centralized media and civic control. And while officially freedom of expression exists, the reality in practice can be quite different. Um, there's a lot of pressure on and interference with critical voices, which undermines the freedom of speech, which might exist on paper. So this is a bit of an overview of some key aspects related to policy, related to media and policy in the region surrounding Paraguay. I also want to emphasize here that individual nation states do have sovereignty, of course, over their own laws and regulations. And while intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations and the ITU and the OECD can make recommendations and set targets, it's up to each nation state to implement and enforce their own laws at the end of the day. So there's not a great deal that the international community can do, you know, to interfere with approaches taken by governments. Likewise, intergovernmental organizations can't really criticize Central and South American policies much. They can only emphasize and draw attention to what's happening, but they can't really step in or intervene. And that's also something for us to keep in mind. Another area of background that's relevant for us to understand relates to just how many people are connected in this area. How many people are really able to access digital media in these regions? So this table shows figures comparing the Americas. As of December 2020, North America had 345 million internet users, <clears throat> which is 95% of the population. South America had 307 million, almost 72% um, almost of the population. And Central America had 109 million, which is 61% of the population. So there are now more internet users in Central and South America than there are in North America, if we're looking just at the numbers of people. Um, if you look at the green column on the right, you can see that the numbers for Facebook users are a bit less, but they're still substantial. So there were 263 million in North America compared to 266 million in South America and almost 100 million in Central America. If we have a look at some specific countries, we see there's a lot of mobile communication happening. People are often accessing the internet through mobile, mobile smartphones, um, more, more so than computers. And this chart here shows that access to the internet has significantly grown in recent years. So the orange column is the percentage of internet users in 2010, and the black column is 2018. And we can see that in countries like Paraguay, Guatemala, Cuba, and others, there's been significant growth in the last decade. So these regions really are catching up in terms of their participation in digital spheres and digital policy is now increasingly an issue for them as a result. And the way that digital policy has played out so far, as I mentioned earlier, is really to be focusing on promoting the digital economy and to fo focus on protecting government values and power online and ensuring that critical voices are kept quiet on social media. And this has also been referred to as what's termed the captured liberal model. So this is liberal meaning neoliberal and enabling a digital society and digital economy and captured meaning it's under tight government control subject to their political power. So this has been going on for a long time already with traditional media, which are owned by these enduring media dynasty families. Um, the majority of television channels in many South and Central American countries 
have had very close relationships with government from their beginnings. There were always, the, always these joint restrictions on content that opposes the government within the media. And so this is now translating into digital policy. So it's important for us to be mindful of these enduring forms of influence on public debate, which emerged in the traditional media era and which have really defined the way that these media conglomerate conglomerates operate. Um, and these traditions are being brought into the digital realm. Many countries across Central and South America have structures like this, which is a result of their similar histories. And as I've mentioned, there's this long tradition of governments forming alliances with the major media monopolies and with the families who run these media dynasties. And that's informed media policy in the past and it's still informing media policy today. Um, it began with the transfer from colonial power to autocratic rule when countries were allowed to be independent and form their own governments. These governments were often autocratic to enable, at least in theory, a seamless transformation of society from being under colonial rule um, to being independent. These often autocratic governments led to politically polarized parties to an unstable governments we see in the region and really, you know, to, to constant kind of political crisis, unfortunately. And through this critical political voices were silenced in mainstream media from newspapers to television, and then more recently to internet and social media as well. If we look back to one of the earliest forms of, um, you know, kind of globalized communication technologies that was established um, across, the, across the world and with the interests of colonial rulers in mind, we arrive at this map of the telegraph lines from the late 19th century. So though these lines are now very old and outdated, they really have left enduring marks. So colonial powers relied heavily on the telegraph, being able to communicate a message in the space of a day through the telegraph really enhanced the power and direct influence empires could wield on their colonies during this period. Underwater, underwater telegraph lines were installed connecting continents and connecting colonies to the seat of the colonial governments um, in Spain and Portugal in the case of um, Central South America. And that's why when we look at Central and South America, we see this um, specific colonial infrastructure in place as well, where cable lines are running around the continent, but not across it. It's about connecting out of different parts of the continent to the places of colonial power in Europe. So here's some history on the development of this colonial infrastructure. Um, you can see here it says the beginning of uh, Western Telegraph Company's operations in Brazil dates back to the year 1873 when the first cable was laid along the coast between Rio and Bahia. In 1874, a cable was carried across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe for the first time linking up the great South American country to the old world so that news could fly across in the space of a few seconds. It's a tribute to the genius of the first inventors of the cable system that there has been practically no change in the course in the years of, um, in, in the composition of the protected rope that spring, uh, swings beneath the deep seas. And these cable routes are still in operation today. So if an email is sent to travel between two neighboring cities in say Brazil and Peru, it still travels through this colonial infrastructure path. It goes from Brasilia to Fortaleza in Brazil, which is a coastal town, then through submarine cable to the US, through Miami, passed back through California, then down the Pacific Ocean to Lima, then to the destination. So it's an 8,000 kilometer trip between two cities, which are only 300 kilometers apart. And that's because this old colonial infrastructure is still in place, at least up until um, 2013. 
So we can still see this enduring influence of the earlier colonial infrastructure in this region in terms of how um, information and data is, is you know, traveling, where it's traveling um, and how far. In 2013, a fiber optic ring was built across this northern part of South America. And this has enabled a direct connection for digital data and communication between these countries um, to circumvent this process of traveling up to the US rather than directly across the continent. So not only is this more efficient, but these data points are, you know, that, that were going into the US, for example, are captured by all sorts of surveillance agencies. And so this fiber optic cable also ensures that the communication stays within the region rather than going up into US territory. Another cable line has also been installed connecting South America to Spain and Portugal. Um, this was set up to enable faster communications and connectivity, not only across the region, but also between the continents. Um, and this is a, really an investment in digital economies and communication spheres on the one hand, which sounds really great, um, but there's also another side to this as well, which I'll draw out in a moment. And here is a bit more on this digital economy focus. In this OECD report, they talk about digital transformation, but reading between the lines, we can see some criticism here as well. They highlight so-called development traps, which involve circular self-reinforcing dynamics, and which are the result of long-standing weaknesses in terms of capacity building. This is pretty soft language and they're drawing attention to structural challenges. These challenges are being addressed um, with initiatives like the installation of the cables. And this is one side of the digital economy, but they also very carefully talk about some of the gaps and issues which need to be improved. They say governing the digital transformation is a crucial public policy issue Changes to institutions, regulations, and markets are needed to ensure the fair, equitable advancement of the digital transformation. Governments face new regu regulatory challenges, not only in managing issues arising from the digital transformation, but also in, in ensuring that it benefits all. So they don't go into detail on what that really involves. They just say it needs to be done. Um, and they also say that the safeguarding and protection of consumers also needs to be ensured. And not just the consumer, but also the citizen. And there's a major disparity between these two aims. So the OECD says Latin America needs to safeguard the consumer to ensure they have trust in the digital economy. But on the other hand, there's also the citizen who needs to be able to raise their voice and deliberate with peers, discuss critical issues on social media and the internet more broadly. But that's not really included here because the OECD is only focused on economic development. Some of the issues or the areas that they've looked at in relation to the digital economy include the promotion of digital infrastructure, broadband, high capacity networks like the intra South American cable line set up in 2013. They look at the use of digital technologies in businesses, the promotion of a regional digital market and all of these other ostensibly great things. So the OECD have tried to provide guidelines for governments in Latin America to establish these forms of digital economies. However, as I've been noting, there is this other side to these positive developments around the digital economy. Governments are now exerting their control on social media and in digital spaces. And really this is the underside of digital policy across these regions. So there's heavy, heavy investment in digital economy on the one hand, and really significant interference with all kinds of digital spaces on the other. Okay, so now I'm going to take a look at the Paraguay context specifically. So you can see here that as of June this year, according to Internet World Stats, 
84.9% of the population are using the internet and 66% are using Facebook. So this shows us that the majority of Paraguayans are online in some capacity and two thirds are using social media, namely Facebook. But it's also important to acknowledge that there's still some 15% of Paraguayans in these statistics, which are not online, you know, according to this data. And here we get um, a more detailed picture of how Paraguayans are connecting to the telecommunications networks. So you can see on the spider web chart there that there's a high level of mobile cellular, uh, cellular subscriptions, but very, very low fixed telephone and fixed broadband subscriptions. So very, very low fixed broadband, very low um, fixed telephone subscriptions here. And then you can see here really high mobile cellular. So this tells us a story of rapid telephone and internet leapfrogging, whereby the majority of the population has kind of leapfrogged the conventional communications um, development pathway of having a landline phone or a fixed broadband connection before they had access um, to this through a mobile device. So people have gone from having, you know, often no landline phone and no fixed broadband internet to a mobile phone and potentially a smartphone that's connected to the internet. So populations and communities that may have relied on sharing, you know, the few landline and internet connections that were available, um, then very quickly got access to mobile phones as they became more accessible and as the telecommunication infrastructures sustaining them became more developed. And this, as I think we all know, has had some pretty big impacts all around the world. Um, so that's some background on Paraguay's recent telecommunications development. A major drawback for Paraguay's telecom sector is that the country is landlocked, meaning that it's dependent on neighbouring countries for its connection with the submarine cable networks um, that I outlined a few moments ago. And this helps to explain why there's been relatively low penetration of fixed broadband services because of this dependency um, on neighboring countries and which has had led to, to higher prices for these services. So there have been efforts in recent years to install a sovereign fiber optic network connecting Paraguay to these submarine cables in order to bypass this reliance on neighboring countries and lower the costs. But so far it's yet to be implemented. Um, and I'm sure that the pandemic kind of um, had a role in, in delaying that as well. In terms of their historical media policy context, Paraguay has a similar story to the broader narrative that I outlined for Central and South America. There's a concentrated media system currently shared between the um, Zuko Lilo group, the Vierci group and the Cartes group. Um, and these groups are connected with political parties. So the VSC group, um, the owner's nephew is the Minister for Technology and Communication. And the owner of the Cartes group is former president Horatio Cartes. So they own a range of assets across television, radio and newspapers and other non-media companies. Um, and this gives them quite a bit of power in setting and curating the, the public media agenda in Paraguay. And combined with ties to the government, we can see that there is a diminished level of free and unfiltered media here. As with other countries in the region, there's also diminished freedom in the media as a result of threats faced by journalists. This is particularly the case in the Argentina and Brazil border areas where drug trafficking and corruption pose especially high risks for journalists. And since the year 2000, 14 journalists have sadly been murdered, including a student and a citizen journalist, and, and none of these murders have been solved. But this very serious um, loss of life aside, extortion and threats are far more common um, 
and uh, you know a, a fairly regular challenge that journalists in some areas have to face. These threats can lead to self-censorship and thereby also reduce the freedom of expression and information that's able to be communicated through the, uh, through the Paraguayan media. And while the violence isn't as high as in Mexico, Colombia or some other Central American countries, corruption and judicial impunity combined with organised crime's influence in political and economic activities obstructs journalists' abilities to perform their intended watchdog role in Paraguayan society. The 2022 report by Freedom House states that corruption and impunity are serious problems and anti-corruption laws have been poorly implemented. Cases, cases often languish for years in the courts. During 2020 and 2021, allegations of corruption were made regarding the purchase of COVID-19 supplies by the government and the selling of medications um, on the black market, which exacerbated shortages of these in the country. And this led to anti-government protests and the resignation of the health minister. And in August of 2021, the US Treasury Department sanctioned three prominent businessmen based in Paraguay um, for their alleged role in international money, in an international money laundering scheme, which according to US official, officials um, involved local politicians, police and judges. The Freedom House report nonetheless finds that the, the government transparency is gradually improving um, and the effective implementation of access to information laws has strengthened investigative journalism. But there is still quite a bit of room for, for, for development here um, as the transparency initiatives that are introduced often go unenforced. For example, in late 2019, an online platform intended to track publicly purchased health ministry supplies and allow citizens to report drug shortages were shut down without explanation, thereby shutting down its intended transparency function. So this shows a very real example of how a failure to enforce a digital policy initiative had potentially quite severe consequences in terms of people's health during the pandemic. Okay, so that's some background on the media landscape in Paraguay. Um, I'm now going to look a bit more into digital media and digital policy. So the most recent figures from Data Reportal shows that in January 2022, there were 5.41 million internet users in Paraguay with the internet reaching 74.5% of the population. Now, this figure is a little bit different to the one that I mentioned earlier that was from Internet World Stats. Um, and, and that one was taken from June of this year and was using a different data set. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that there. Um, according to Data Reportal, there were 4.55 million social media users in Paraguay in January this year, equivalent to 62.6% uh, of the population. And 7.23 million or 99.5% of the population are using mobile devices. So mobile phones are really the key communicative and connective tool for Paraguayans. Okay, this infographic shows the digital growth over time. And it's interesting to see that there was a 5.8% increase in active social media users from the year before. And here we can see the growth in internet users over time with a pretty fast and steady rise in the numbers of people using the internet from 2012 to 2022. And this shows us a large proportion of the population has pretty quickly and pretty recently come online. And this um, infographic here shows us the types of devices being used for the internet. Again, the dominant device shown here is the mobile phone with three quarters of the web pages being accessed via mobile phones. Um, 
laptops and desktop computers are responsible for almost the remaining quarter of traffic to, to web pages. And looking now at social media, as I noted before, there are 4.55 million social media users, making up almost 63% um, of the population. Half the population is using Facebook and just under a third are using Instagram and Facebook Messenger. Twitter comes in with just 8.1%. And based on figures from 2019 from a different data set, um, 36% of the population are using WhatsApp and that might have increased um, a little bit since then. So taken together, these various statistics show that Paraguay is an increasingly digitally connected country with growing digital, social, um, digital and social media usage. So let's take a look now at what Paraguay is doing in terms of its digital policy approaches. So the constitution protects privacy and individuals' rights to access information or data about themselves or their assets that's held in social or private registers of a public nature. Of course, the constitution couldn't have predicted the need for um, data privacy protections we face today in the digital context um, and in our increasingly digitalized world. So there's some protection given here, but a great deal more detail and nuance is needed in order to meet the complex ways privacy is being navigated today. The government has also established the Ministry of Information and Communication Technologies in 2018, which is responsible for the creation and implementation of public sector ICT plans and projects. This was a step forward in acknowledging the important policy work that's needed in the areas of communication technologies. And it shows the government's intended investment in this domain. At the end of 2020, the personal credit data protection law was enacted. This is another step forward in that it establishes new definitions of personal data, which includes among them biometric data and it seeks to enhance personal data security online. It also gives the data subject, that is the person subject to the, to the law, um, more robust rights to access, rectify and object to the use of their data. And it incorporates the right to be forgotten. Interestingly, it also acknowledges that personal data that's transferred internationally should be subject to the stipulations of this law, but the specific requirements around this aren't set out. Um, so it's hard to see how this would practically be enforced or could be practically enforced. Another aspect of the digital policy focus is the national digital agenda put forward in 2017. This agenda emphasizes three core priorities, digital inclusion and ICT use, the advancement of digital government and innovation. These map onto the National Development Plan's goals, which are focused on poverty reduction and social development, inclusive economic growth and deeper inclusion in the international economy. Additionally, Paraguay has also sought to partner with the European Union through the EU um, Mercosur Association Agreement, which aims to increase cooperation in the digital economy and in innovative research. So as it says in the heading on this slide and on the last, we can see a strong economic focus across all of these developments in terms of digital policy. As a country that's still one of the poorest in terms of GDP in the region, it's of course reasonable to see why this focus on the economy is driving government policy in regards to digital media. But nonetheless, there are some important issues to be looked at more strongly um, and, and to be addressed in the Paraguayan context. So while there's been some progress around protecting and expanding on definitions of data, there's still no specific data protection authority. 
So issues around corruption and impunity are also important for us to think about here as more and more data is collected. How is that data stored? How do the data protections that exist now hold up against the threats of extortion and corruption, which we know are ongoing issues for Paraguay and the broader region? What might happen if this data ends up in the wrong hands or how might data be manipulated to create a false representation? Another big gap in Paraguay's current approach to data policy uh, relates to emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and machine, and machine learning, big data analytics, cloud storage, and facial recognition. And as we've seen all over the world in the past few years, including over the border in Brazil, the spread of disinformation online is another big issue relating to digital media that's in need of more robust and more careful policy responses. So platforms like Facebook and Twitter have implemented their own measures around this and many governments around the world have introduced various regulations to curb the spread of misinformation, particularly in relation to COVID-19. Um, and indeed, you know, we can look to the progress made elsewhere around the world as a guide in thinking through how countries and regions can respond to some of these issues with emerging digital technologies. So the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation brought in in 2018 has already driven a great deal of progress in this space. Countries all around the world have since introduced their own measures, um, many of which are modelled on the GDPR. And the Digital Markets Act, set to come into force in October this year, is likely to spur even more, particularly in terms of regulating and, and pushing back on the big tech monop monopolies like Google, Meta and Amazon. It's also important to acknowledge that what we're seeing in Europe is a result of a very, very different political, economic and social um, and cultural context to that which we see in Paraguay. So while there's a great deal of room for improvement, there are additional challenges in terms of the historical and political background of Paraguay that I don't wanna disregard or dismiss either. Um, and the GDPR itself is not all encompassing. While it offers an important step forward in setting out the rights of the data subject and, and protecting the data subject's privacy, there are many elements of the emerging tech issues that I just listed out, which are also not addressed in this regulation. So these are issues for governments and intergovernmental organizations like the UN um, all around the world to be thinking about, not only Paraguay. With that being said, Paraguay can and will benefit from developing data policy around the rights of individuals who are producing and engaging with digital data, or as the EU terms them, data subjects. Though developing the economy is no doubt important for everyone in the country, there's a real need to look beyond this to also focus on the digital citizen and accordingly, the protection of their rights online. As our digital footprints get bigger and bigger and more and more aspects of our lives become datafied, these rights will only become more important. And so Paraguay, along with every other country, is gonna to have to step up to this challenge, perhaps led by the nonprofits and the human rights groups and students um, and journalists and like anyone else who's in this audience right now, um, you know, who believes in the necessity of these protections and regulatory initiatives. Um, okay, I'm going to leave it there um, and open up for questions now. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Estelle. I have a, a few questions here. Sure. The first one says, at which country can Paraguay look up as a model for the construction of digital media policy? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting um, question because um, Camilla, as you'll know from the subject that we, we had together last semester, 
there's a lot of different things that are happening around the world and there are good things that are happening in different places um, and I don't know that there's any one country that is doing everything, if you know what I mean. So um, as I sort of was, was speaking about towards the end of that presentation, there's a lot of um, more kind of substantial forward looking um, policy that's coming out of Europe, um, country, countries like Germany, um, France, um, the UK is, is doing stuff as well. So there's some really, I guess, positive steps happening um, in Europe. So I would say that that might be a place to look. But I guess I would also say that, um, you know, the point I'm, I don't want to overlook that point that I was making about, you know, really recognising the unique context of, of the, the Latin American um, region, because there is this, like, you, you've got to keep in mind, Europe is the one that's putting out all this policy, right? Europe is also the centre of power that you know, has caused all of this pain um, to not only not only South America, Central America, but parts all around the world. So I don't want to overlook that either. And I think that there are going to be some really interesting and innovative things that can come out of these regions um, that can potentially, you know, push back against some of this, this, what we might kind of look at as another version of kind of digital colonialism in a way. Um, with these policies that we, we don't want to just look to Europe and saying, well, whatever they do, we have to do it as well. We can think about what, how, how can we make this better fit our challenges and our situation? So, so things like impunity, things like corruption, things like, um, you know, organised crime, all of these issues that are really, really major to the media um, and the, the experience of, you know, society in, in these regions, um, I think are things for for the experts in those areas to be to be looking at because they they will know much more about that than I could possibly. Another person asked, "What should be the first step as a country to start exercising more and better control over personal data on the internet?" Um. So again, like I think we have seen some really good steps forward in this. Um, resulting from um, broad kind of sweeping changes that came out after the GDPR was implemented because, um, you know, you, you see it in so many different websites now. There's an acknowledgement that there's cookies, things like that are happening where they never used to happen before. Um, I think countries need to be kind of investing in, um, in supporting digital literacy of citizens to making sure that they're actually aware of the rights that they do have, that they understand, you know, how information is um, stored, how data is accumulated online and where it's going. And, and I say this when probably a lot of the people who are in government don't even necessarily know about this or have this as a front of mind issue. Um, so I think a greater emphasis on the importance of this, because I really do believe that as we go forward, um, you know, we, we are increasingly living our lives in ways that are tracked and traced through our data. And this is really like an emerging field. And we don't know how this data is going to be used or stored or potentially come back to, um, you know, create problematic things for us in the future. Um, so this is something that I think needs to also be put to you know, politicians as being coming from the people saying this is actually important to us. Um, and, and for that to kind of, you know, be um, advocated for as an issue that government can then act on and regulate on and, and you know, try and kind of deploy these initiatives that might help um, the everyday kind of Paraguayan citizen, the everyday Paraguayan mobile phone user who's accessing banking and and you know, government support things, and you know, leaving these traces of themselves online, um, so that they actually understand what they're what they're doing and how that information, um, you know, is is part of it's 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 something that they they should own and and have an awareness of and an access a level of being able to access as well. This other question is related. I think it says. Uh, what we can do if our data do not have any protection? The situation is very worrying. Yeah, I mean, 
Um, it's it's a it's a big question. So I think there are some, as I was, you know, detailing um, when I was looking at the policies that are there. Th there are some protections for data um, in Paraguay, and certainly Paraguay is doing better than a lot of other countries in the world. So I don't, you know, I'm not trying to put Paraguay as this place that is is really far behind because it's, you know, it's doing its best to kind of catch up. Um, and obviously, as I said, in terms of the country's economy, that's the focus because the governments are just really concerned about money. Um, so in terms of what can you do if your data doesn't have protection, um, I think, again, it's, it's around bringing this issue into the spotlight as something that citizens, as, as that voting citizens care about. Um, often that's the best way, you know, to, to, to kind of get messages to the people that have the power to regulate and, and make better protections is to let them know that the people who are going to be voting at the next election care about this um, and, and want to see action on this and that that's something that would sway their vote. So I think, you know, the, the, the power that we do have um, to kind of set these agendas is, is what we need to use in this space to kind of um, help spur change in the directions that we want to see. Um, and that, that can go to, you know, as I said, nonprofits and um, advocacy organisations and, and various other legal kind of expert organisations that I'm sure exist in Paraguay as well. Um, and they're probably already working on this. And so linking in with them um, as well, because they're going to be able to, again, you know, actually speak in, in much more depth about what, what is actually happening and what Paraguay is, is doing in this space already. This is the last question in said, amazing presentation. Thank you for addressing Paraguay as well. What is the impact of the leapfrog to mobile usage in the population? Could this be handled to use as an advantage? Um, yes, that's a, a great question. I think what we see, and this relates to, this goes back to kind of data literacies. Um, so what, what we kind of, I think, see in these places that have had this leapfrogging of, of internet connection um, is that people suddenly have access to this fully developed online world um, where they can do so much and share so much information and, you know, put, put all this stuff out there and leave all of these traces of themselves. Um, and, and these are people that possibly, and I'm, I'm not trying to either to be patronising or dismissive either and saying that, oh, everyone who's suddenly got a mobile phone, they didn't know, they don't know anything about their data rights. I'm sure a lot of people are mindful of this. But nonetheless, there's probably going to be a greater chance that there is less um, digital and data literacy on the part of the user that has only just kind of begun using these spaces and maybe isn't necessarily as... Um, isn't as experienced in navigating potential risks um, for themselves and, and, you know, where and, and judging, you know, the, the um, credibility of online information and online um, websites and things like that. Um, so I would say that that's, that's one impact. I think another impact which relates to the second question around how it can be used as an advantage is that, you know, as we've seen, again, in places all around the world that have gone through similar shifts, um, giving citizens access to, you know, connection in these kind of digital communicative spheres is really powerful um, from the point of view of democracy, from the point of view of engaging in these kind of national dialogues, from the point of view of holding um, governments accountable and increasing transparency. Of course, there are these issues in Paraguay around, um, you know, self-censorship and extortion and threats, and, and that's very real as well, and that's a big issue. Um, but nonetheless, the, I think an advantage of, of this kind of experience is that there's all these people that previously weren't able to access this stuff who now can and have that real desire to kind of participate and be a part of the conversation and have their voices be heard um, and learn about, you know, what is going on. And so I think that that is something that is probably already, um, you know, producing some benefit for Paraguay and will continue to do so. And that's a way that we can kind of 
you know, be using that to push for um, not just like reform on issues around data protection, but reform on issues around all kinds of problems facing the country, um, because that's it's a way of the grassroots, you know, coming up um, and having their voices be heard to the to the people that actually have the power to do something about it. Thank you so much, Estelle. And thank you very much to the audience for the questions and for joining today's session. To our amazing panelists that share with us her knowledge in the area. I would like to remind everybody that you can rewatch these and other talks of Paraguay Speak 2022 on the Paraguayan Student Association Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. Today was our last talk of Paraguay Speak 2022. So I would like to end by thanking all the people who are going to organize this edition, the speakers who within their very full agendas gave us their time to share their knowledge. Thanks to the GSA and the University of Melbourne who has sponsored the initiative and Becalan, the Embassy of Paraguay in the Commonwealth of Australia who supported. Hope we can see you all again in our next edition. Cheers, Awiye. Thank you, Stel. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining me.